ingratitude and grumbling sent us on a downward spiral, thanksgiving does something in the opposite direction as well. Welcome to Living Truth, a media ministry of the People's Church. We share clear biblical teaching to help you experience Christ and grow spiritually with our global church community. Wherever you're joining us from, we're so glad you're here. Today, our guest speaker, Sundar Krishnan, will be sharing about the other side of grumbling. You guessed it. We're going to be hearing all about the importance of Thanksgiving. Here's Sundar with today's message. Thanksgiving doesn't come naturally. And I've discovered that as you get older, it doesn't get any easier at all. Or it doesn't seem to be. And yet, it's a big deal. Just like we learned last week that grumbling, the other side of the equation was uh, a big deal and we needed to take it seriously because God takes it seriously. In the same way, Thanksgiving is a big deal with God and with us. So I want to just kind of slowly build the pieces together so that just like last week you left saying, yeah, I need to do something about this thing called grumbling. I trust that today you will go with that same kind of resolution and say, God's word has helped me to see how I need to pay attention to this as well. So let me just walk you through some scripture like we did last week. First and foremost, Thanksgiving is a big deal because it's part of our worship. Not just the singing that we've done, which is amazing. And we're thankful to God for that worship team. But thanksgiving is an act of worship as well. In fact, when I look at all the one another commandments in the New Testament that we are familiar with, love one another, greet one another, be kind to one another, you would expect to find thanksgiving show up. You know, there isn't one single direct exhortation to thank one another, even though it is implicit. In fact, when I typed in thank you, the phrase, into my Bible study computer program, I discovered that all 10 of them had to do with thanking God, even when human beings had done things that evoked the thanksgiving. For example, look at Paul in Philippians chapter 1. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day to the last. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me Yet it was kind of you to share in my trouble. Notice he's thanking God. Notice he's rejoicing in God for all the things that the Philippian church had done for him. Because after all, it was God who had inspired them to do that. So even where the human elements were in the forefront, the thanksgiving seems to be directed first and foremost to God. I think this just reinforces for us the fact that the vertical dimension of thanksgiving is of fundamental and primary importance, even though the horizontal one is critical. In fact, of the 153 references to thanksgiving in the Bible, over a third of them are in the Psalms, which is Israel's worship manual. So thanksgiving is evidently a part of our worship and therefore a big deal with God and with us as well. Secondly, thanksgiving is a big deal because thanklessness has the potential to send us on a downward spiral. Uh, in the first chapter of the book of Romans where Paul is tracing very early history in humanity when he's, discovered, he's describing the downward spiral of humanity, from one level of degradation to another. Three times in that passage we read, God gave them up, God gave them up. Look how it begins in Romans chapter 1, verse 21 to 23. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became, and notice the effect of that lack of thanksgiving. They became futile in their thinking, their foolish hearts were darkened, Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of an immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Now, in the pre-modern pagan world, the idolatry that resulted from thanksgiving was literal. 21st century North America, the idols are much more sophisticated, that's all. But in fact, they happen to be anything that we put in the place of God. Any created thing, animate or inanimate, is good because... Genesis 1 says everything that God made was good. 
So it's not a matter of looking at something bad, but taking something that is good and making it God. Looking to some created thing for ultimate satisfaction that only God can give. Now, how does that happen? You see, because the less grateful we are, the less we focus on enjoying what we already have and focus instead on getting the things that we don't yet have that we think are necessary to make us joyful. So it makes us covetous and makes us discontent. And then because we also want it now, instant gratification is a huge part of what is ingrained into this society and in us through it. Impatience comes in. And the interesting thing is that fuels the ongoing cycle of idolatry because impatience leads to idolatry. Most of you are familiar in the Old Testament, the single paradigmatic act of idolatry was the golden calf that the people of Israel built. That we know very well and what happened afterwards. What we don't know or don't notice very often is how it all began because Exodus chapter 32 that describes the building of this golden calf idol introducing the sin of idolatry into the very ethos of Israel. It took the horrors of the exile to flush it out. You know how chapter 32 begins? When they saw that Moses was too long in coming back. Impatience led to idolatry. So over here we have this cycle. This lack of gratitude leading to discontent, to idolatry, or to impatience, fueling the whole cycle. That's the downward spiral. Also, relationships get strained because of that. Because when we focus on what we don't yet have and getting it, we naturally look at the people who have it. And when we become envious of them. And when envy comes into a relationship, it's hard to have an enriching relationship with it. We also can get irritated and upset with people in our lives who we think are keeping us from getting what we want. Maybe a spouse that won't give us permission. Maybe a boss that doesn't give us the raise. Maybe someone who got to the corner office faster than we did because status was important to us. These are all the negative consequences that start with something so innocent as not giving thanks. Fortunately, there's a strong positive side to this as well. Just as ingratitude and grumbling send us on a downward spiral, thanksgiving does something in the opposite direction as well. There's a story told in the Bible, and Jesus, in fact, tells the story about ten lepers who once called out to him, Son of David, have mercy on us. Here's what happens afterwards. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, Were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Now, it's a minute we say, what do you mean? Your faith has made you well. They were already healed. That's why the guy came back. So what does Jesus mean when he says, your faith has made you well? Well, he certainly had faith in the beginning enough to call out to Jesus to say, son of David, have mercy on us. Though he didn't specifically ask for healing. Probably implied it. But by the time he came back to Jesus, he was already healed. That's why he came back. So what did Jesus mean when he said, your faith has made you whole? Notice he didn't say, your faith has made you healed. This is a different word. Whole, well, sozo, salvation. Body, soul, health. What he thought he was thanking God for was only from the healing from this terrible, socially isolating disease that we call leprosy. What he actually got from it was wellness of his whole soul. So it would seem that in some way, thanksgiving has this potential to work full orb salvation that much more deeply into our being as well. So both the downward spiral of thanklessness and the upward spiral of thanksgiving make it into a big deal. Finally, it's a big deal because it would seem just like in the opening story that I told you that we're not good at it. Let's go back to the story of the ten lepers. Jesus not only pointed out the one guy that came back and said, see, drawing our attention to him in the story, he also took time to point out the fact of the other nine who didn't come. He said, where were these other nine? What happened to them? And actually it's an interesting question, isn't it? Because if in this sanctuary, 
If 10 people suffering from serious illnesses of various kinds were all healed, I don't think you would need a sermon from me or Pastor Brett or anyone to tell you to be thankful. You'd be exploding in gratitude. You'd be telling your friends that this church might have a special Thanksgiving service because of that, as well they should, if that were to happen. So what's wrong with these guys? How come they were not more thankful? Why only one out of the 10? I don't know, the story doesn't leave us hanging, but I can speculate. Because interestingly, they weren't healed right away as soon as Jesus didn't say right away to them, okay, you're healed, like he did in other cases. He said, go to the temple and show yourself to your priests. Because you see, even when you were healed, it was, it was the priests in the temple that had the authority and the power to pronounce you whole so that you could re-enter society as a functioning person and not be isolated anymore. Here was the clue, here was the interesting fact though. You were required to do that after you were healed to have your healing confirmed. Here Jesus was telling them to do something before they were healed that only made sense after they were healed. So it was a remarkable call to faith, wasn't it? To say, go. Now, how far was the temple? We don't know. How far were the priests that they had to show it to? We don't know. How long had they been traveling when they suddenly discovered they were healed? Something like that must have happened because that would explain it, wouldn't it? Then nine of them said, ah... Oh, I am feeling thankful, but I would not have to stop and go all the way back and find him. I don't know how much time that's going to take. Besides, if I get to the priest soon and he pronounces me clue, I can finally get back home. And by the way, you would have had to understand how terribly isolating leprosy was. To feel the force of that temptation. And so we can't be too hard on them. But something like that must have happened. The story is incomplete as far as that is concerned. But it seems to suggest to us that we and all have a tendency to forget the giver because of the gift and to focus on the gift at the expense of the giver. Because it takes time, it takes effort. Well, think back, think back to the number of times where we've sat before a hearty breakfast or a hearty lunch and we dig right into it because we're hungry, because it's tasting good, looks good, without even a word of thanks. Or if we do say thank you at all, it's a quick saying grace. The same word is rolling out of our mouth every time, but without any feeling of thankfulness. What if we actually, even once in a while, put in a little bit more effort? Or if you took a couple of moments to think about, what would it be like to be sitting at that same table but with your children's plates empty. You can hear the gurgling and the rumbling in their stomachs because they haven't eaten for a couple of days. And they look at you with sad eyes, tears rolling down, and say, Daddy, I'm hungry. Boy, to think about that for a few moments would be heart-wrenching, wouldn't it? Yet there are many, many families around the world that go through that kind of experience. We don't have to. Now add to it a few more things. You're gonna to go to work, you're glad you have a job. Your children have a school to go to. And if any of them happens to fall sick, why? There are doctors to help us. If you need medicine, there are well-stocked drug stores around the corner. There's clean, fresh water to drink, even to bathe in. And yet how many of those things happen day after day after day without even a pause for Thanksgiving? when the default mode is grumbling. I mean, listen, these are privileges that three quarters of the world would be deliriously happy to have, but we don't even think about it. Now, I'm including myself, don't get me wrong, I'm not scolding you, I'm just asking you to think with me. I think one possible answer is that we actually like grumbling. It feels good, doesn't it? To let somebody know how we actually feel, of mur 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 like the gong that we talked about last week, murmuring under your breath, but loud enough so they can hear you. Because they need to know that you're unhappy, right? So much of the pleasure of grumbling is letting the other person know that we're unhappy, right? Right, right? <laughs> yeah. It takes, it's an actual sacrifice to say, no, I will forego that pleasure, twisted though it is, that grumbling gives to me, and instead put in the hard work of learning to be thankful, shifting my focus away from what I want that I do not have to what I already have that I really want, if I think about it. 
That takes effort, doesn't it? That's the sacrifice that's involved. So for all of these reasons, these four things that I mentioned, there's probably more. Thanksgiving is a big deal. It's an act of worship. Thanklessness has potential downward spiral consequences. Thanksgiving has the potential to invade our own soul with wholeness and salvation. And it's a big, it is hard, and therefore we need to learn to focus upon it. All right. The, in the rest of the message, let me handle an objection. What somebody might say, listen, my circumstances are difficult. I get it. I get all this that you're talking about, Sunda, but my circumstances are difficult. Um, I don't have a job, I lost a job maybe, or I actually don't have enough money to buy good food. I don't have enough money maybe to buy the medical care that I really need or my aging parents need or whatever. How can you expect me to be thankful in this situation? Well, what does Paul say in 1 Thessalonians 5.18? He says, give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Notice he doesn't say give thanks for everything. We're not supposed to thank God for all the hard times. I know some people think they do, and this is my own opinion. Think about it. He says, in all things, all circumstances give thanks. So, it, so even though some of you may be in very difficult circumstances in these days, the question comes, hearing about the importance of thanksgiving as you are, what things am I able to give, thank God, give thanks to God for that are independent of circumstances? Well, let me take you back very quickly to 1994. My father died in October of 1994 uh, after a two and a half year battle with stomach cancer. Three day, but he died the week before Thanksgiving. So three days after his death, I had to preach twice on Thanksgiving. Would you like to preach a sermon on Thanksgiving three days after your father passed away? Now, it was made a lot easier than normal because my dad had committed his life to Christ just three days before he passed away. But still, the pain is there. The sorrow is there. But in order to make my Thanksgiving message as relevant as I could, I asked myself this question. What would I have preached if my father had passed away without giving his life to Christ? How would I preach a sermon? What, what Thanksgiving fuel do I have in those circumstances? And I trust that might be helpful to some of you who are not in very thankful-inducing circumstances but still are called upon to be thankful. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8, we read these words. Paul says, to me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. That phrase struck me that time. And, th and the better handle you can get on the unsearchable riches that we have in Christ, the more fuel there will be for thanksgiving, fuel that is independent of circumstances, so that in all circumstances you can give thanks even though you cannot thank God for those circumstances. And let me have, I only have time to trace one of those unsearchable riches of Christ. And I'll end by pointing you to a little exercise you can do to deepen your understanding of that. I want you to think about just your salvation and my salvation. Probably almost everybody sitting here can talk about a time and a place where they prayed, their sinners pray, you know. Ask Jesus to come into their heart, whatever the force was, receive Christ as your savior. Maybe in a church, at an altar, maybe your parents led you to Christ when you were young. Maybe it was in university, but you can tell that story. Now that's simple, that's what happened in visible reality. You prayed the sinner's prayer, you asked Jesus to come into your life, and your life was transformed, and here you are. Praise God for that. But Let's take a few moments to look at what had to happen from God's perspective in invisible reality to make that simple prayer actually possible. It is when you look at that, you will see the earth-shattering, magnificent, huge gift that salvation really was. And there are three powerful images in the scripture I want to draw upon, leave them with you. First of all, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 4 to 6. In their case, the the unbeliever, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. In our natural condition, before we became followers of Jesus, we were blind. 
We did not have the spiritual eyes to be able to see the beauty and the glory and the worth and the majesty of Jesus that we would receive him. We couldn't sing the kind of song that we sang, worthy, worthy, worthy. We didn't see any of that. But what did it take for that blindness to go away? Paul says, nothing less than what happened in Genesis chapter 1. When God penetrated the darkness for the first time by saying, let there be light, he said, we need a new work of creation where God commands the light to shine into our darkened hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The Hebrew preoccupation was with light, Greek preoccupation was with knowledge, and Roman preoccupation was with glory. Paul takes all three of them and said, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God is all found in the face of Jesus Christ, and I am now doing a work in your heart that your blind eyes will be able to see it. That is what was happening in invisible reality so you could pray the sinner's prayer. Then look at Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 to 6. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. You were not only blind, needing illumination, you were dead. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Not only were we blind to the glory of Jesus, we were dead in our sins and dead people can't do anything to save themselves. It's not about being tossing a lifeline to a drowning man. A drowning man or a drowning woman has enough life left, left to go and grab the life ring. A dead person can't do that. Something had to be done to us to be able to pray that sinner's prayer. The fancy word for his regeneration. You know what it says here? God, because he was rich in mercy, came to these people who were dead and couldn't do anything, and he made them alive in Jesus. He then united us with Jesus in his resurrection, so we were raised together with him, and then seated with Christ, far above all principalities and powers, those very demonic forces that had kept you blind, and blinded until God's light shone through, now you are ruling over them. Why? Because he took people who were dead, made them alive, raised them up with Christ and seated them with Christ in the heaven. Do you see your salvation getting bigger and bigger and bigger? <laughs> That's the second thing God had to do. Not only make blind people see, but make dead people alive so you could pray the sinner's prayer. And then very quickly, the third one, Colossians 1, and 22. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Yes, you were blind needing illumination. You were dead needing regeneration. You were also hostile at enmity with God, hating God, doing evil deeds. And he took you and he made you love the God that you hated he reconciled you to the God from whom you were distanced. And he blotted out the record of your transgression so there was no more record against you and you couldn't be charged with treason against a king and be executed for it anymore. You're a completely clean record. Three beautiful pictures of what God did in invisible reality, all of which was translated into a simple, Jesus, I receive you into my heart prayer. This is just one dimension of the unsearchable riches of Christ. All of it connected to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. What if this were to become our default thinking? What if every time when we felt like grumbling, you could just say, Jesus, I thank you that when I was blind, unable to see one shred of your beauty, you commanded the light to shine in my heart so that Jesus became light, power, and glory to me. I thank you that when I was dead in my sins and my trespasses and therefore unable to do anything, that you made me alive with the life of Jesus you united me to yourself, Jesus, and raised me up and seated me with you far above all principalities and power, so that I have new spiritual authority in the heavenly realms in my life. And Jesus, I thank you that you took a God-hater and made me into a God-lover. You took me when I was far away from you, wanting to have nothing to do with you, and you brought me close to yourself, and you have completely cleaned and expunged my record so I can never be charged with rebellion against you again. How long will you stay in your grumbling frame of mind? 
but it takes time. It takes effort. Get a hold of the unsearchable riches of Christ. We hope you've been blessed by today's message. Let's read through the book of Hebrews in the coming week for reminders of the riches of Christ that have been given to us. Now, let's join our worship team for a song of praise to our great God. <laughs> 